submarines of the Indian Navy. Submarines has always intrigued all of us because very less is heard and read about submarines. But I'm very sure that this motivating talk of Commodore Uday Chutnis is definitely going to serve as a booster for all the youth to join the Indian Navy and especially the submarines. There is a very famous quote, habits are like submarines, silent and deep. That was on a lighter side. Let us listen to certain achievements of our speaker today. Our speaker today is Commodore Uday Chitnis, and he's got no Sena medal. He served in the Indian Navy. Commodore Uday Chitnavis has had a long and an illustrious career in the Indian Navy. Born in a middle class family from Vidar, at a very young age, he joined the Rashtriya Indian Military College in Dehradun, which is a feeder institute to the National Defense Academy, where apart from regular schooling, he was also trained in drill, physical training, outdoor sports, etc. He joined the NDA in January 1969 as a cadet and successfully completed the training in December 1971. He was commissioned in the Indian Navy in July 1973 as an executive officer. In April 1974, he volunteered for the submarine arm and qualified as a submariner in July 1975. He was selected for a specialist course in communications and electronic warfare, which he qualified in April 1980. He held several appointments in the arm, salient being the commissioning executive officer of INS Shishumar, the first German submarine procured by India. Thereafter, he commanded the same submarine, INS Shishumar. He was awarded the Nosena Medal on 26 January 1991 for his devotion to duty. He was promoted to the rank of captain in July 1993. He thereafter commanded INS Satvahan the submarine training school, INS Gomti, a guided missile frigate, and INS Vajrabahu, the submarine base on the west coast as Commodore commanding submarines in Mumbai. During this period, he was actively involved in planning submarines operations of the west coast of India, which, which also involved Operation Parakram. He was also the principal director of submarine acquisition at Naval Headquarters, New Delhi, which dealt with issues of submarine modernization and new acquisitions. In the year 2003, he was sent on deputation to the Coast Guard as Commodore Coast Guard Region at Chennai, which looked after all the Coast Guard deployments and resources on the East Coast from Haldia in West Bengal to Kanyakumari, in Tamil Nadu. During this appointment, he was actively involved in search, rescue, and rehabilitation along with the East Coast of India, and especially after the tsunami had hit the East Coast in December 2004. In May 2006, he was seconded to the National Cadet Corps, the NCC, as Deputy Director General of NCC. Tamil Nadu and Andaman Nicobar, where he actively interacted with the youth. He retired from his active service in August 2008. Sir, on behalf of Prahar Samad Jagruti Sansta, I welcome you. I would, now, you. Yes, yeah. I would now like to request you to kindly begin your talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shivali. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Can you see the slide? Sorry. 
Shivali, can you see the yes, slide? Sir. Yes, yes, sir. yes, sir. Okay. Right. So. Uh, dear friends, uh, I'm going to talk to you about submarines. An insider's view. I specially chosen the name as an insider's view, basically because I've been a submariner for the larger part of my service in the Indian Navy. I shall be talking to you about submarines. I'll try and keep the talk as simple as possible. Although I'm uh, often uh, required to give you a general insight as to how the submarines function. But I am trying to keep the talk as simple as possible. This is the submarine dolphin, which once you qualify as a submariner, you wear. And it's a very prestigious dolphin. It's not easy to come by. I shall cover my topics in under the following heads. Basically, genesis of the submarines, part of the submarines, evolution of the Indian submarine, submarine training, the Tower of Confidence, the growth, nuclear submarines, culvery, submarine weapons, and a few personal anecdotes of mine. Submarines, if uh, all of us are aware, or at least two thirds of our I mean, the world is filled with water. And there is a general tendency to try and exploit this. In the history, we have a record of people exploiting this as early as the Greek philosopher Aristotle writes, who records that the Alexander the Great used diving bells to enable men to descend and prevent people from destroying their barriers underwater. This was something around the 3000 or 332 BC in the siege of Tyre. Well, all this is history. First basic idea of a submarine is what you see on the slide is a Bushnell's turtle. He attempted to make a submarine, waterproofing it with a wax and had a screwdriver in the front and paddles. And this is what was the first basic submarine. As record goes, uh, the US ordered their first submarine, Holland, around the 1900. In between, there have been various attempts at making submarines and having them dive and surface. But submarines, I would call all these as submersibles. I wouldn't call them submarines. The ideal submarine, however, I will come to later. I will now just cover the parts of the submarine. This is a photograph of the submarine hull under construction. You can look at the entire hull. This is being built in the yard. All the equipment is loaded inside and then the submarines are joined together. The submarines have about several miles of cables, piping and all that. This is a very raw photograph. And this is the one which and shows maximum pressure. So this is what is important for a submarine, the pressure. Uh, well, coming to the layout and the basic parts of the submarine. If you look at a submarine, this is a EKM submarine, a kilo class. You can see the bow plates and the aft plates, the propeller. There is the main propulsion motor here. The batteries, I will come to these also later. Then this is the control room or the area where all the action takes place. This is the torpedo room, the torpedo tubes, the propulsion motor, and an emergency hatch for escape. 
plus crew accommodation. It's a very cramped accommodation. In fact, every three sailors have two bunks on board. That means the third sailor is always on watch and that is how they manage. Coming to the basic idea of how a submarine dives. Submarines have ballast tanks on either side. You can see these on the side. They fill, when on surface, they are half empty or nearly empty. When they want to dive, they fill this with water and then they go down. Plus, they have planes and the motor which controls their descent down. And when they want to come up, these holes are blocked, the vents. They're called the main vents, they're blocked and compressed air is pumped into the water in the ballast tank and forces the submarines to rise. So this is a basic functioning of a ballast tank, very important. The philosophies differ. This is just a photograph of the layout of a submarine engine room. You can see how complex the machinery is. These are the diesel engines and a lot of these. And it, all the personnel who are on board are required to get to know basic functioning of all the equipment, irrespective of their trade of qualification and This is the type two or nine. It's slightly more different. This is a single hull. Its ballast tanks are only in the forward and the aft. And again, main batteries, which are the main requirement for propulsion. This is the engine room. In this case, they have a combat information center, which has all the electronics. That is the, your radar, your EW, your sonar, control from here, and a control room which controls the submarines for its diving, surfacing, and maintenance. Here you can also see periscopes and a whole lot of masts and arrays, which are all required when you're diving. These are the periscopes. This is a radar. There is a snorkel mast, which is required for running the diesel when you are just a few meters below the water. Just to give you an idea, this is a battery, a lead acid battery. You can see the individual standing next to him. Each battery weighs about 500 and odd kgs. And on a submarine, there are about 500 such cells. This is the main propulsion of the submarine. That is a diesel electric submarine when it's dive. In case of the nuclear submarine, of course, they are only used for emergency and they don't have that many. They have a nuclear engine. Ah, coming to the Indian Navy now. Indian Navy, we attempted to buy submarines way back in the early, uh, late 50s and early 60s. Our first attempts, in fact, our officers and men went for training to UK, but we could not get any submarines from them. They turned our offers down and did not give us any submarines. It was only in, the, on, in 1967 that we contracted for the first Calvary class. You can see this Calvary class at a presidential review where people are manning that. But this is the first submarine procured by the Indian Navy. After that, we procured three more of these, that is the Calvary, Karanj, Kursura, and Khanderi. And they participated in the 1971 war. They were used for blockade and controlling traffic to a certain extent. After that incident, we acquired four more submarines, the Vela class. Namely, Vela, Wagli, Wagir, and Wakshi. Here you can see a photograph of the Vela class. These are slightly different from the Calvary class in which they have an underwater sensor added to it, which was the frequency analyzer. So this is what a Calvary class or a Vela class was. Now coming to the part of trading. 
training is a very very important facet of the summary now and it requires every individual to be aware of all aspects of the summary training you have it's a very complex platform we have generators motors aro plants consoles and a lot of it is now controlled electronically digitally plus you have to have standby systems which in case of a digital failure can run with manual control here you can see the officer on the periscope and the crew is carrying out and simulated attack drill which is what they have to do you have simulators in case of the indian navy we have two simulators one in mumbai and one at visakhapatnam the mumbai one caters for the shishumar class and the one in visakhapatnam caters for the russian acquisitions which were there another major facet this is what requires a lot of effort you here you can see an indian individual coming out of the tank this is a submarine escape suit which you have to wear and do the drill prior to embarking on board this is important facet until and unless you qualify this you cannot become a submariner in the next small photo you can see one individual entering the torpedo tube now torpedo tube three people enter inside the torpedo tube one after the other each holding the person in front's legs and then the tube is filled with water and the bow door that is the front door of the submarine bow cap is opened up so that this individual can one by one escape it's a very claustrophobic kind of an atmosphere but once you do that you are positive to see yourself as a submariner this training is required to be done every 5 years to be validated and trained now coming to the growth of the submarine arm by the mid 80s we realized that our submarines which were basically a fall out of the world war 2 vintage that means the vela and the calvary class were taken or built based on the german design or the type uh, 12 as they were known in the german world war 2 and modified or improved to a certain extent so that we could get them there and after we realized that submarines had become much much more sophisticated and we needed somewhere to start doing that ourselves so the indian government in the mid 80s started talks with the german navy and we gave an order for two to be delivered from the german yard and two to be built in the our own mazgon docks in mumbai now that is how we have become a builders navy this is we joined the elite group where submarines were being built and we managed to build two of our own submarines shalki and shankul which we commissioned in 1992 and 97 but these submarines are a lot more different here you can see they have a rescue boy these are sonars and various other things we also procured sindhugosh class from russia we procured 10 of them here you have seen a photo of the torpedo loading taking place on the submarines that means the weapons which come they have to be put on this tray and taken in this is a very major revolution you have to trim the submarine down so that your bows come up these bow caps come up above the water normally you can see the water line is well above this and then one by one with hydraulics 
we pull these weapons inside. We also load the missiles in the similar fashion. That is the tube launch missiles. This is a photograph of a EKM or the Russian submarine when they were leaving Russia. You can see the severe winter there and the kind of snow which is accumulated on top. This is in the midst of winter and our sailors and officers have handled this kind of weather and managed to survive all that. So it is a very tough sort of. Now, modern conventional submarines still have to come up to periscope depth. That is just slightly below the water, raise their snorkel mast. The snorkel mast is somewhere here. Right now it is lowered on this photograph and it has to be raised up so that you can get in fresh air to start your diesel engines. All diesel engines run on air. So you need fresh air. And that is the time when the conventional submarine is at its weakest because this is where they require to be at that depth to charge their batteries. Now batteries can sustain the submarine for a fairly long time, but it depends on how fast you go. If you go at full speed, they may run out in an hour, but if you do an economic crawl, which is doing two knots to five knots and generally patrol around, you can stay probably a day or even more depending on how you operate these batteries. So that is the main reason. Now, to answer to that is that you have a nuclear submarine which doesn't have to come to this depth at all and has tremendous endurance. The endurance may last up to about six months in case of a nuclear submarine. And they stay on patrol depending on human endurance rather than the, uh, the efficacy or the ability of the submarine to stay on patrol. This is a nuclear submarine. And it is very rare that you will find a nuclear submarine on surface. Now, it has a very major role to play. It can do very high speeds. It would be a major force multiplier when it comes because it can move at speeds of 20 to 30 knots underwater and move from place A to place B and be ready for an attack. So a nuclear submarine is a tremendous development. We in the Indian Navy have this submarine chakra on loan and have, are building two submarines at the moment and many more to follow. The next Arihan has been commissioned in the Indian Navy and there is Arighat, which is undergoing trials, should be commissioned soon. So these are the two submarines at the moment. They are, this is a submarine known as an SSN, that is a attack submarine, while a ballistic missile firing submarine is known as an SSBN, where you can fire a missile from the submarine to ranges as far as 3,000 miles away. It is controlled by uh, inertial navigation system and go directly to the spot where you want to attack. Now coming to the Calvary class. This is a, the old Calvary class over a period had to be decommissioned. Commissioned in 1967, they are old. They were, they were decommissioned after about 30 years of service. Now in lieu, we had done a contract with the French submarine yard to build the Scorpion class, which were known as the P-75 India. They are being built in Mazagon docks. And up till now, we have Calvary, Paranjan Khandari in commission and Fort Vela, which is undergoing street trials and two more under construction. They are an improvement on the Shishimara class, 
you can see a distinct improvement that the four planes have moved to the fin. This has a more sophisticated sonar array. They have towed arrays. They have trailing antennas. They have uh, EW systems. They have fire control systems. And all that, if one were to go into a room, uh, the submarine control room, you would possibly see it like a computer game. There would be so many issues there and it would be very fascinating, especially to youngsters. Now coming to the uh, Pursura Museum, this is one of its type in the world. I've visited a large number of submarine museums, but this one was an actual submarine brought onto the jetty. You can see the torpedo tubes and the entry made into the submarine now, I mean, this submarine especially. This is the bird's eye view of the submarine as seen from the sky. And these are some of the pictures of the submarine arm with the manic winds. This is the place where the is known as a wardroom has now been converted into a hospital or a sick bay. This is the control room where all your valves for high pressure air, various exactly. This is the top window room and this is the communications room. So you can see the kind of equipment machinery which is located in the submarine. In fact, more stress is laid on the machinery than human comfort at times, especially on the uh, Russian ones. The Germans have modified it much, much more better. Now coming to the weapons, here you are seeing a mine saddle. The submarines carry mines. You can launch them through the tubes in case of the Russian version. In case of the German version, this is a mine saddle which is attached to the submarine from either side. You load mines from the top and you can then fire them. Now mine laying is a very, very sophisticated art. You have to know exactly where your mine is loaded because after the war or after the evolution, you are required to sweep that mine. So navigation has got to be very accurate. And this is done by having an inertial navigation. You pinpoint the mine and block the harbor or choke the enemy harbor as it may be. <clears throat> this is a submariner's uh, pleasure to have a look at the target. You can see the crosshair and you can see the warship as a target on your submarine. And invariably, all commanding officers tend to have a look at the target prior to firing the weapon. Now, one would visualize to say, okay, how you come so close to a submarine or to a ship? The idea is not that this is a look through a periscope, which has a magnification of about 12 times what you can see. Just to give you an example, we used to be both in the Mumbai Harbor inside and ships used to be at anchor about two miles or three miles. And with the periscope, you could identify the individual who was there standing on the deck. In fact, on several occasions, we could see who it was. Uh, this is a simulated or a display of a attack on a task force which is coming. And the submarine invariably would fire its torpedoes. Torpedoes have the power to break the keel of a ship and break it into two. I will show you a photograph later. And submarines then use the thermal layers to avoid being detected. Now, underwater, there are thermals. That means the temperature from top to bottom changes. And to detect a submarine, all these ships have to use sound. We have not 
found anything else other than sound to detect a submarine. So you can make out a submarine. So to avoid detection by ships, the submarines then use the layer, go well below the layer and hide. So they have an advantage when they're operating vis-a-vis these -vis ships. This is a torpedo attack on a target ship. We, we do this occasionally to prove our weapons and see how effective they are. This is a missile attack. This is a torpedo attack. And this is also a torpedo attack. So you can see these photographs of each of the attacks. Now, coming to the nuclear part of these submarines. This is a nuclear submarine carrying out a missile attack on a ship. The advantage of an air launch missile is that you have standoff ranges. That means well beyond the range of the enemy ship, you can fire this missile and carry out an attack. It may be as far as say 20 to 30 miles away and carry out an attack. This is a SSBN firing a ballistic missile. Now ballistic missile is vertically launched and it can go to a range of about 3,000 miles, depending on the type of missile you carry. We are in the Indian Navy, and of course, you're aware we are developing missiles ourselves. So these are the ones which would be fitted on board the SSBNs in the due course. Another role, which is also of vital importance, is attacking another submarine underwater. Detections mainly is by sound. In fact, over a period of time, your sonar op operator is so confident that he would be able to tell you with the detection of the sound, what type of an engine is there? Is it a diesel engine, electric motor, or a steam turbine? And at what speed it is generally moving? So all that would be depicted by the sonar operator and indicated to the fire control system. And you do a certain maneuver to then attack the submarine targets. Okay, I've now finished basically, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, now coming to the anecdotes point of view. And I think these are issues which most of you would be interested in. I will basically start with uh, when I joined the submarine army. And uh, those days we were, we used to be on surface longer because our batteries were uh, not that capable. And we dived prior to the ships coming in. So invariably we were asked to dive, say, when you had a radar contact or a, and then avoid the ships. So these times it was a cat and a mouse game because the ship knew where you were and you were trying to hide. From the, uh, the first incident, which I would like to highlight is about our return passage of Shishumar from Germany. We were returning from Kiel and passing the English Channel. Now in the English Channel, the channel being very shallow, the submarine cannot dive. You know, you need about at least 15 to 20 meters of water before the submarines could dive. And in the English Channel, that was not available. At that time, the weather deteriorated and the officer on watch on top of the submarine had to actually stay tied up to this fin uh, he would be tied up to this fin and we would be rolling approximately 30 to 40 degrees. On occasions, the officer of the watch has touched the water there. 
and it was so bad that people inside could see things moving but because of the sea state we couldn't stay on board uh, without lying in our bunks other than those on watch so for force we had to enter a shelter port lehav and then stay there for few days before we came out but that was the sea state on surface the submarine is best when it's underwater we then had an incident in the arabian sea when the shishumar class again after a long voyage from the suez canal and down we said we'll surface for a while and when we surfaced we saw a pakistani atlantic on top which was cruising along and dropping sonar boys to get our signature now getting a signature is very important because that forms a database for future attacks and there we were we could see the sonar boys being dropped we then conveniently used to go next to the sonar boy pick it up and keep it on board so that they couldn't get our signature so again it was a issue where we really had a great time playing picking up their sonar boys i don't know how many of you are aware of the sinking of the ghazi now pakistani submarine ghazi was sunk off the coast of waisak people look at it as how we managed to sink the submarine but important aspect is operating in shallow waters sinking a submarine is extremely difficult sinking a submarine itself was difficult what we understand was that that submarine could not surface because it was very close to waisak harbor and our ship which went out detected it and managed to sink it next uh, a very uh, important issue which i want to tell you about is submarine patrols i happened to be on a patrol off the coast of pakistan and uh, i was commanding that submarine then it was a difficult period and uh, as we were doing our regular patrol we decided that we will change our entire schedule that means our day became the night and our night became day that means the crew got over a period of time changed around from the normal cycle of day and night so that in the night we could stay awake and visualize the submarines or visualize what was going on on that particular occasion i still remember we sighted three pakistani destroyers coming out and uh, apparently they must have got a disappearing radar contact a disappearing radar contact is once they are operating radar and they pick up a contact a metallic contact and it vanishes it is known as a disappearing radar contact and 9 out of 10 it happens to be a submarine so they were aware of our deployment as an indian submarine of the coast of pakistan and therein after there was hell to pay in the sense they charged to the area where they had a disappearing radar contact and there were a lot of weapon firings a weapon firing can be unnerving to a submarine because once a, it's like a pressure blast and that entire pressure blast then happens to this launch various equipment even on a submarine if it is close by but we were lucky we again used the thermal layers and managed to escape them and we monitored their conversation on a patrol the submarine is incommunicado 
that means it does not communicate with anybody else and our headquarters at mumbai and delhi they were aware of these weapon firings and disappearing radar contacts because they were also monitoring the communications and they were unaware as to what exactly transpired there and after so they then forced us to terminate patrol and come back our patrol was for about 45 days we came back in about 30 odd days and the moment i landed back the first thing the chief of staff turned around and asked me is i hope you are not caught now it was very embarrassing to tell him ki sir i was not caught otherwise i wouldn't have come back here but all the same that was one experience which i will never ever forget the kind of weapon firing they did and it continued for about 4 to 5 hours with their uh, sonars pinging the kind of intense pressure they built up on that entire episode during op parakram i happened to be the squadron commander i actually was commanding all the submarines on the west coast and that was a very tense period basically we had deployed five submarines on the coast of pakistan now submarines deployed in such close proximity is a very challenging task and that was the first time the indian navy had five submarines on forward deployment off the coast of pakistan monitoring all activities as it is pakistan uh, navy was practically bottlenecked by our navy and by the submarine arm we had ensured that they would have no movement of convoys or any other things from that port but that was again a very very challenging task the last incident which i would like to give you was two humorous incidents one was uh, catching rain now you may be asking me what is catching rain submarines have very acute on water we normally have bath once in 3 4 days that is on the shishumar class and on the vela class invariably after a week or two weeks depending on so air conditioning all that is very important this was on vela we were on a return passage from the from bloody vostok to india and en route in south china sea the sea was flat calm we had surfaced so that people could have a little bit of fresh air and there were clouds of rain which were happening at various place you can actually see it raining there so the submarine would charge there there would be crew on the casing taking a soap and having a bath that was catching the rain on the surface because they couldn't make it otherwise and that was saving water for us but we were trying to catch rain wherever it was raining and it happened if we may have continued for 2 3 hours when the entire crew had a bath and came down one more uh, humorous incident was we were again on patrol of Uh, the gulf and uh, we were to be there for a long time so that was a period of may and june and uh, during this period alfonso mango is in great supply and our steward had ensured that we had adequate stock for the patrol so he brought crates and crates of mangoes and packed them in and he used to be very i would say we would call him a kanjus that time but he would be very strict in giving just one mango per person per day that's it the rest of it was all taboo it so happened that because of the decrease of hostilities we then managed to be uh, to come back a little early so we were told okay finish your patrol and come back and on our way back then it was a mango feast we had mango from breakfast eat lunch dinner every time there was mango of some sort of the so that was another humorous incident in the sense at that time 
looking forward to food was something very unique. And just on food, to let people know, there is on submarine adequate food of all kinds. In fact, right now, DRDL is making uh, packages where you can have biryanis, you can have parathas, you can have... Otherwise, frying is generally a taboo on the submarines. Because then, you would be, all of you would be smoked with onion or whatever flavor which is the fall of the day. So this is what I have, just a brief, I know I've run through it largely. I would have liked to go in a little bit more detail, but I have tried to keep it as crisp as possible. Thank you. If there are any questions, I would like to ask you. Sir, I think that was very wonderful, very informative for all of us. Many questions, I think I'm very sure that the audience might be having many questions. I would request all of you to kindly put it in the chat box so that uh, I can ask it uh, across to uh, Commodore uh, Chitnavis. So the basic question which I have in my mind is, sir, uh, yeah. you mentioned about this uh, class, Calvary class. I've also often heard about the Delhi class, Kolkata class. So, yeah. uh, so what is what is this uh, class? Uh, how are submarines? You know, uh, submarines and ships are classified by class basically because of a typical design. The equipment they have in a particular class is generally standardized. In the sense, let's say Calvary class, it had a typical type of say radar sonar, the diesel engines, all that is standardized to a certain level. Now, if you look at the Calvary class and the Vela class, I gave you a small hint to say that you had a frequency analyzer added on board a Vela class. The yes. sonar may have been upgraded. Sure. What was the original older version, it has now changed to a newer version on the Vela class. So, a class is identified basically so that they are all standardized. If you need a particular type of equipment, you can look at a certain class. Let's say Calvary at sea requires a, a specific, say, transformer or a, a PCB chip. Sure. You can then go down to the class and identify it and pick up its spare from the stores and send it across. So a class is basically to facilitate uh, logistic management, the aspect of ship maintenance and there and now. Sir, sir. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have one question from Prahari uh, Shivam and that is, sir, uh, is there any advantage of diesel submarine over nuclear submarine? Say again. Uh, is there any advantage of diesel submarines over nuclear submarines? Yes, there are certain advantages, no doubt. See, diesel submarines are quieter. Quieter in the sense, over a period of time, they run on electric motors, they are more silent, more smaller, more difficult to pick up. A nuclear submarine invariably, because of its nuclear plant, is reasonably big. In the sense, the smallest nuclear submarine known is a French nuclear submarine. Um, our nuclear submarines are about 3,000 tons and above, while a conventional diesel submarine may be as small as a 1,000 tonner. So detecting a submarine is an issue. And when it comes to detecting uh, diesel submarine, it's much, much more difficult. Diesel submarines can operate in shallower waters. That means yeah. where, like let's say Mumbai Harbor, you have yeah. very shallow waters. It is a continental shelf. You, yeah. you can operate there. A nuclear submarine will find it difficult. These are, yeah. otherwise nuclear submarines are the ultimate submarines. Yeah. That means they can remain submerged for days together. It's the human endurance over the uh, physical endurance. Sir, sir, thank you so much, sir. Uh, sir, I have my course mate also uh, listening to your talk, uh, Kanchan Hello. Vivedi. 
and uh, she's put a question that how do you deal with uh, certain uh, um, sailors or officers on board submarines who've got claustrophobia firstly the moment you volunteer you are you go through a psychological and medical checks sure. and like i mentioned if you cannot qualify the uh, submarine escape test you cannot become a submariner now that is where claustrophobia hits you the hardest imagine in a tube three of you with water flooded and of course you have a mask and all that and if you can stand that claustrophobia 9 out of 10 you are you do not have a claustrophobia when you come on board ha huh, there are occasions when you get claustrophobic but generally claustrophobic individuals do not stay on submarines long enough they quit <laughs> the arm and it's a voluntary arm so they quit say within 2 to 3 years at the best uh so there's a question by one of the students uh, who's uh, uh, aspiring to join the national defense academy he belongs to the prahar foundation of the nda and he uh, he wants to ask you uh, how is the oxygen level maintained in the submarine oh yeah i i didn't go into too many technicalities but this yeah. is a very good question yeah in the submarines oxygen is of vital importance and if you stay dive for prolonged periods your oxygen levels have gone down to as low as say 16 17% which okay. by normal standards is extremely low in the shishumar class they have uh, uh, oxygen tanks which can bleed oxygen and ensure that the mesh maintains level in the uh, russian boats they used to have rukshateri boxes as they call them which burn and generate oxygen but they get very hot and uh, these are then prone to explosion so they are used very conservatively converse i mean very uh, conservatively you have to put those plates into the box and then generate oxygen but the standard answer to all this is you come up put up your snorkel mask and recirculate the air you run your diesel engines so fresh air comes into the submarine and the foul air the diesel engines throw out so you get so oxygen is of vital importance on nuclear submarines you have oxygen generation possible because of your nuclear reactors uh, so you mentioned about uh, you know you don't fry uh, in the submarines otherwise the full submarine will be full of smoke so the question pertaining to that sir do you have tin food on the submarine uh not exactly we used to have but not to that extent I mean, tin is the last option which we prefer you have yes. fresh food you have a cold room which ensures you have fresh meat stock and normally you have it for 6 to 7 days meat meat vegetables all that and beyond that now drdl has come up with ready to cook food which you just put in boil your food and it is as good as anything else like you said biryani or you know yeah. chole bhature or whatever all that is possible in fact food wise it is a treat at times when you <laughs> you got to get used to it only that's the thing okay uh-huh. yeah I see a lot of questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. yes. Sir. Uh, uh, so the question is, uh, uh, how many submarines uh, do we have in the Indian Navy which are actually operational, sir? See, every submarine over a period of time has to go through its maintenance cycles, which are known as. Uh, a short refit a medium refit a long yeah. refit all that has to go through it's a part of the uh, maintenance philosophy of the navy yeah. we at the moment have 
about nine EKM class, four Sushumar class, three the Calvary, new Calvary class, the fourth one in N group, yeah. and three nuclear submarines. Over yeah. a period of time, I would say 60% of this would generally be available for deployment. Yeah. This is a, uh, I would say, a very general opinion. It could vary, but 60% of these, because you have to give them a regular maintenance. It, okay. It's a similar thing like you getting your car serviced, you have to get your engine on board, clean, check, your systems tuned up, all that is a regular feature. Uh -huh. um, so there's a Prahari Isha Patil and she wants to know, sir, uh, how uh, do submarines deal with <coughs> natural calamity? Uh, say if there's a, a tsunami like, uh, you know, you said that uh, in 2004, you were into uh, the tsunami. So how uh, does a submarine deal with all these natural calamities? Okay. See, tsunami is basically a pressure wave which goes along the uh, seabed. It moves along the seabed and as it comes closer to the shore, that is when you see the maximum effect of the tsunami. In fact, uh, all what would happen to a submarine when this pressure wave is that you will get pushed. But for a submarine to face up to a tsunami, in fact, at sea, the ideal thing would be to come up shallower because the sea wave goes, I mean, the pressure wave moves along the seabed and it should not. In fact, uh, during the tsunami, which I witnessed as ComCG, the Coast Guard commander, ships at anchor of uh, the Chennai harbor were not damaged as much as ships which were inside the harbor. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, you okay. rolled, you pitched, you tossed around. Maybe your anchors got dislodged or ships at sea. At, but that does not affect a ship at sea because the pressure wave moves along the seabed. It does not move in mid-ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a cadet from a naval unit of NCC. I guess he's from three Karnataka naval unit NCC. And uh, his question is, uh, in your time, was the distance measured in miles or nautical miles? In nautical miles. Nautical miles. Okay. All right. Uh, sir, another question uh, is uh, how much fuel uh, and what type of fuel does a submarine have and uh, how much fuel does it require to sustain for a day? Uh, in comparison with a surface ship, your fuel requirements are minimal. We have uh, low sulfur, high speed diesel, which is our main fuel. You have fuel tanks on board. You carry that fuel. Once fuel is embarked, mm -hmm. the submarine can last at sea for about 45 to 50 days because the fuel is used only to run your diesel engine. And a diesel engine is run in a submarine for on an average on petrol for an hour, hour and a half, not more than that. Mm -hmm. When you are at your weakest. So that period, your consumption may be a few odd, I mean, less as less as a ton, which is not very much in comparison. And you carry about 50 to 60 tons of fuel or more, so you can sustain yourself for long periods. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so what is the defense mechanism of submarine? Uh, I mean, how does it defend itself if uh, there is any torpedo attack from okay. uh, an enemy submarine? So. See, basically, in, in the sea, there is a so, thermal layer. The temperatures from the surface temperature on top till you go down varies very yeah. differently. Yeah. The main detection 
by a surface ship or by anything else is by sound. And sound does not travel in a straight line underwater. It bends away from the medium as the temperature reduces. That means if you're looking at a submarine, um, a sound wave transmitted, it would initially, depending if your temperature was isothermal, that means yeah. from top to about say five meters, the temperature was the same. It would go in a straight line. And yeah. if the temperature started falling down, this sound wave would then bend. Yeah. This is an area where over a period of time, you would realize that you have a layer where the yeah. submarines would then use that temperature layer to go below that temperature layer and avoid being detected. This is the standard uh, submarine avoid, I mean, avoiding detection. It would go below the layer. Once you're below the layer, it's far more difficult to pick up because then your the ship on top would not be able to make out where exactly the ship is, the submarine is, the target is. So it, it then has to use several ships to isolate and detect. And that is one of the major things underwater. Um, sir, like you said that, uh, you know, you detected by sound. So, sir, there, there might be numerous sounds under the sea uh, bed. There, mean, are, there are numerous sounds, but each sound is peculiar. Sir, you so can uh, all this training you might be getting uh, when you, uh, you... A lot of the training you do, you have... What we do is when we go on a mission, we collect a lot of data of various types of ships, their platforms, their signatures, their propeller noises. In fact, you can make out if one of the propeller is cracked, then there are propellers which are singing basically yeah. because of, so you can identify. And if you have been able to cite it and identify, you then can train your sonar operators to pick up that sound and say, okay, this is a ship with three propellers yeah. and moving ahead, whatever they are, and what speed they're moving, what RPM they're doing, all that. So sounds are different. There are sounds of fish also. You can make out a fish. In fact, <laughs> you can hear a whole lot of whales chattering at night. And they're quite a nuisance, especially for a submarine, because then they can, you know, sort of, blank out the actual size of a target ship coming in. And you can make out a target ship in miles. I mean, the sonars now are so good that you can actually pick up a sound, say, 15, 20 miles away. Uh -huh. uh, so we have a question from Colonel Tambe, who's a veteran and who's the, witnessing this program from, uh, uh, from Pune, sir. And he himself uh, was in the Army Medical Corps. And uh, so he has a question, what is uh, the medical cover facility in a submarine, sir? Uh, Colonel Tambe, sir, basically I'd like to tell you that submarines are fairly well equipped from the medical point of view. In fact, I think I showed you a photograph of the uh, museum where they had made it out to be an operational theater. We generally have a doctor on board when we go on a long deployment. Otherwise, we have basic medical assistant who can do elementary sort of uh, when you're on a deployment of the coast. In fact, there have been cases on the nuclear submarine chakra there um, carried out an appendicitis operation at sea. So, Doctors, wise, there is adequate, uh, you have an operation table, you have all the facility where you can carry out an operation if the condition so decides. So, uh, so we have Prahari Satish Mode who wants to ask you, I think we'll take just two more last questions and we'll uh, call it off. Uh, he wants to ask, sir, uh, have you seen the movie Ghazi? And if yes, sir, uh, then how many facts are shown in the movie and how much is the, uh, you know, 
the normal commercial picturization. Uh, you want my critical view or my... Uh, so critical <laughs> view, critical view, because <laughs> that will be the actual view. You see, uh, a lot of it has been exaggerated or... Uh, there are several aspects which are correct. I'm not saying no. But mm -hmm. um, let's put it very frankly, it is not as glamorous as it is made out in the movie. <laughs> Life is tough. In fact, I would suggest you uh, a German movie about the U-boat. I forget uh -huh. the name now, but that is much, much more authentic when you see. This was uh, probably made for the Indian audience where we like a lot of, uh, you know, pomp and show. I think that's the <laughs> Okay, sir. Uh, so what are the communication lines of a submarine from when you're in the deep seas? From there, how do you contact uh, uh, the headquarters yeah. on the land? And there has, it has been a lot of improvements in submarine communications. Firstly, a submarine generally never transmits its own data. I mean, transmits on its own until unless yeah. there is an emergency. Today, we have uh, antennas which you can raise when you're at periscope depth or you have a trailing wire antenna, which means an antenna which floats on the surface and you can pick up communications. What happens is we have a LF station in uh, Tamil Nadu, which is meant extensively for submarine communications. It's a massive several uh, square kilometers of land where they have antennas and low frequency transmission is transmitted. And we can pick it up on a on the trailing antenna. Now submarines have submarine broadcasts, which mean for the submarines, a special duration is there where messages are sent. And then you can make out by receiving it, is there a submarine message for your particular submarine or is it a general message or it is a specific directive, all that can be monitored. So the time at the broadcast, you put up your antenna, see what messages are there. If there is one for you, receive it and go down. If there is none, you can go down immediately. So that is what the procedure is. You have some main broadcasts which transmit messages regularly every four hours or so, and then you can pick up. So, like, you know, uh, during war times, we say ki dushman ko hum hamesha paani mein dekhte hain. So, uh, very true uh, uh, of that thing, sir. So, I think we should take the last question. Um, and uh, the last question uh, would be, sir, what message would you have for the youth? And especially, uh, you know, the aspirants who wish to join the forces, and as a submariner, what will be your message to this no. young uh, uh, blood? A very, very good question. Yeah. Firstly, let me tell you, I'm when I was uh, young, I was fascinated by the forces. Basically, when I came in contact with my uncle who was in the Air Force, my uncle, another one who was in the NCC, and I was a small kid, I was fascinated. I would still say, if someone were used to ask me what I would do if I was given another chance, would I choose a different career or a different, I would say no, I would still repeat what I have done. <laughs> uh, that, I think, would signify that, you know, forces has a charm of its own. It has, uh, and uh, the submarine arm in particular, Again, when I joined the submarine arm, initially we joined it as an adventure, but then we got so close to it. That is, um, your camaraderie is far better, far, far better that in the sense that you are, you know, 30 of you are inside a submarine. 
for days together so kind of uh, friendships camaraderie you develop over a period of time is phenomenal there are a lot of pluses a lot of pluses and the forces in particular i would say uh, firstly there i mean it's like when i joined from a cadet in school then in nda the friends i have made there i haven't forgotten or we are thickest thieves even now and um, it's a it's a phase where we are going to at the age of nearing 70 we still are when we get together it's like 12 year olds over an issue so forces builds that thing up which i haven't been able to see anywhere else i am not underrating them it's not that it is not possible but this kind of camaraderie friendship you will not get anywhere else the environment the forces generate in fact wherever they are the clean tidy places in fact here in nagpur if you go into the vayu sena nagar it's a culture shock i would say cleanliness wise habitability wise and um, well what can i say further it's the institution of uh, armed forces where well, you know color caste creed doesn't matter it's your friendship over a period of time do that yes sir so i would say that if you're looking for a adventurous challenging life there's nothing better than the armed forces absolutely sir absolutely armed forces in fact is a, a way of life and not a, a of life. career or a profession sir that's right very very correctly said by you sir and uh, i should say that this was this has been the most knowledgeable and the most informative sessions that we've ever had and there are huge lot of questions uh, oh. i am very sure the audience uh, would love to ask you and uh, so let this be the beginning of the association between uh, you and prahar samaj jagruti sansha yeah, where most certainly, most certainly uh, there yes. is no doubt on that i would yes. love to speak in fact a live audience would have been even better but that, that's all right yes that's, that's, yes. That's, yes yes we would uh, invite you sir in future to uh, talk to our students and to talk to the youth oh, uh, who thank you aspirants and uh, uh, thank you so much sir it has been so wonderful to listen to you and uh, for the vote of thanks i would like to uh, uh, request prahari uh, shivani patil who is joining us from mumbai and uh, she is another aspirant uh, uh, like the others who wishes uh, uh, to join the forces and uh, oh, she sir. would uh, do the honors <laughs> she would do the honor shivani okay. thank you ma'am i would like to thank commodore uday chitnavi sir for sharing with us your valuable insights as submarines as ma'am said is a topic which is not much talked about but you have very skillfully highlighted the work of our submarines and submariners for us sir thank you so much the working of the submarines the constructions the the work order the training everything was very beautifully explained to us by you sir uh it was absolutely astounding to listen to your personal anecdotes we all loved it i'm sure many of my fellow or uh, praharis are boosted and motivated to join the navy after listening to you sir once again thank you so much for sparing your uh, precious time with us i would also like to thank mrs shama desh pande for gracing us with her presence thank you so much ma'am for all the blessings and love uh, and last but not the least a big thank you to a wonderful audience which includes the veterans of prahar uh, the nagpur city principals from the school of prahar students and praharis from all over maharashtra thank you so much everyone and i request you all to please stand up for the national anthem <laughs> गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा विंज हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा
तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे भारत माता की जय भारत माता की जय भारत माता की जय थैंक यू सो मच सर थैंक यू थैंक यू शिवाली गुड डे सर गुड डे सर